Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Reverend Karen Setharaman. If you've tuned in this evening, uh, we want to welcome you to the launch of what is now the fourth document produced by Ireland's Future. Uh, Ireland's Future was established to advocate, promote, plan and prepare uh, the future of the island of Ireland. And I think we all agree that these conversations are already happening, they're growing and they're unstoppable. Uh, the document that we're going to discuss tonight, as I mentioned before, is the fourth document and they're available uh, for you to download. Uh, there are previous documents and these have included the principled framework for change, advancing the conversation, planning for a strong economy, and then tonight's document that you're going to get a little snippet to is, is, is centered on rights, citizenship, and identity in a united Ireland. Uh, I want to just say before I introduce the panel that these documents aren't uh, exhaustive. They raise questions and they leave space for further discussion uh, and to stimulate further conversation. So, Thank you for plugging in this evening and thank you also to the two guys who have joined us tonight. Uh, we have Trevor Lunn, who is an MLA, and Professor Colin Harvey, who is an expert in human rights law based at Queen's uh, University. I'm going to get straight into this, Colin. I'm going to begin uh, with yourself, if, if, if that's okay. Uh, I think we agree that as conversations grow uh, and continue you know, with reference to the future of the island. Uh, we would agree that it's paramount uh, that we acknowledge that, that all people are valued, all cultures are valued, all identities are valued. And what I noticed in this document this evening uh, is that it strongly emphasizes the promotion and the protection of human rights. Uh, most of us, if not all of us, uh, would be aware that currently here in Northern Ireland, if I'm right, we don't have a Bill of Rights. And I find that interesting as I read through the document because I know last year uh, there was an ad hoc committee set up, set up for the Bill of Rights and there was lots of consultations that took place throughout this year uh, with, with, with kind of in view of the creation of a Bill of Rights. But the reason why I raise this is because as we move forward, and if we're in agreement that we want to protect identities and culture um, and our rights, how, how does that work? Can you walk us through what that means, not least because we don't have a Bill of Rights and also the fact that we are two states, uh, you know, UK and Ireland. Uh, would, you, would you just talk us through that? Okay, well, thank you very much, Karen, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here mm. tonight. I just want to start really by thanking you and Trevor and acknowledging the, the work that you've done around this constitutional issue. I also want to acknowledge the work that Ireland's future is currently doing. As you rightly mentioned, this is the fourth document that Ireland's future has published, I think, in around a year, you know? So it's incredible contribution to the conversation and there's more events that are happening. So, you know, delighted to see that. In terms of the human rights discussion, maybe if we start with the Bill of Rights. Yes. I think it really what you're highlighting points to a deep and profound frustration throughout this society about ultimately undelivered promises from the Good Friday Agreement. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have a Bill of Rights for this society, and you'll know that frustrations around human rights or inequality are at the heart of the reason why so many people here want change. There's an ad hoc committee that's meeting at the Assembly at the moment, which is looking at how this goes forward. There's advice from the Human Rights Commission that recommended quite an ambitious human, human rights framework for this region. So I think that's important that that advances, but it highlights frustrations in the here and now. That's why I think this document today from Ireland's future is so important, because people feel that this is a moment of change, mm -hmm. that it's time for change, and that human rights need to be front and centre of the conversation. So it's absolutely wonderful to see Ireland's Future launching this document because ultimately the clue to human rights is in the title. Yes. Human rights are for everyone who shares this island mm -hmm. and they need to be at the mm -hmm. core of the conversation. And as you rightly said, you know, this document is one part of a wider debate because really people don't just want a united Ireland. 
People want a new Ireland yes. and they want a better Ireland and a Ireland. And in a sense, Ireland's future's proposition is in a sense that the rights of everyone, that people would be better protected mm -hmm. in new constitutional arrangements because the current arrangements simply are not working. Yeah. So, so would it be safe to say, Colin, in your opinion, um, that, that we're, we're presented with an opportunity as we think about a new Ireland uh, to do better with regards to human rights protect, protection? Would, would you say that, we, that we're actually, we've got a great opportunity to do better? Karen, that, that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. you know, and the language of opportunity is, is so significant for this debate because what a remarkable time we're living through. Mm -hmm. you know, what an exciting conversation to be part of. In a mm -hmm. sense, what we're doing is we're in a discussion about co-designing mm -hmm. new arrangements for the island of Ireland, mm -hmm. arrangements of which human rights will be front and centre. Mm -hmm. There is an issue with delivering on those commitments in the here and now. Yes. You know, because people can't wait for those new arrangements to emerge. So we need to see a Bill of Rights for this region in the here and now, but we also need to see those rights mainstream streamed into the conversation about the future. I suppose what the document really helpfully does as well, I think for me, is point out that there's a framework of international human rights law, regional protections and domestic protections as well. There are also guarantees in the Good Friday Agreement that help shape and frame the parameters of this conversation. But again, as you so rightly said, in a sense, Ireland's future and others is inviting people into the space, yes. but highlighting you know, the facts around the framework that is there. And I think the document is a really, really excellent, really useful contribution to you know, opening up space for that discussion. It's not the last word yes. on the human rights framework, but it clarifies that framework, so I think is incredibly important. Trevor, coming on to you now. Um, I, I, I would love to begin actually just hearing a little bit about yourself and a bit about your background, not least because uh, both of us come from a unionist upbringing, a unionist background. Um, and I know that one of the questions I get hit with all the time is what about the unionist community? What about the unionist community? And so I would love you just to share a little bit about your life and your upbringing. Mm. Um, and then I'm going to hit you hard with some questions about the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah, well, fair enough, Karen. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, my, my upbringing was in South Belfast. I was in a relatively orange family. My father was a very strong orange man, a member of the Black Institution. Oddly, he never encouraged his four sons to join those organisations. But, but uh, growing up, I, I never realised there was anything wrong with Northern Ireland. You know, it was just you know, you're in your own wee bubble and and we wee Protestant bowl, I suppose, and uh, uh, that was fine. But as I got older, I started to question things, started to read about history, which, which was never taught in the grammar school that I mm -hmm. attended. And I began to realise that things are not right up here. Now, compared to the way they were then and the way they are now, is chalk and cheese. I mean, we, we have serious protections in terms of human rights and so on, as Colin would, would agree, I think. And, uh, but... Um, I'm a relative newcomer to Ireland's future. I'm not not quite a year in yet. Um, Me either. Yeah. Never. Well, I joined I joined that <laughs> organisation because um, I like the way they're going about things. I've read their stuff. I'm very friendly with one of the organisers. I got I got drawn into it, but I don't mind that. You know, I don't feel like I was snared. I'm coming come into it on my own free will, and uh, I look forward to working with them. At the moment, I'm. Uh, an independent MLA in Stormont. I was with the Alliance Party. I was a member of the Alliance Party for 30 years on. But um, we, we parted company a year and a half ago. Um, I'm okay now as an independent. Uh, quite happy with my lot. And uh, I look forward to doing what I can to promote the, the <laughs> argument here. Because uh, Ireland's future is, is being very careful in their language that they, they want to promote discussion they yes. want people to know what Absolutely. they will ultimately be voting for mm -hmm. i think that that's very important and that's yeah. that's what i would like to assist with yeah thank you trevor and we, we love having you on board i'm pretty new as well so we're the newbies aren't we yeah you're newer than me <laughs> <laughs> i'm newer than you yes <laughs> um you'd be familiar with the good friday agreement and and the document that we're kind of taking snippets off tonight alludes <coughs> to the good friday agreement yeah. Uh, built into the Good Friday Agreement, there are obligations, uh, there are values and principles 
uh, that, that we truly believe as an organisation must structure uh, our, any debate uh, in terms of constitutional change. Um, I was going to ask you to give us some examples, uh, Trevor, that you feel are critical to our discussions. And, and the reason why I, I kind of want to go here for a moment is because uh, the number, kind of one of the key things that, that certainly unionists would say to me is, look, I, I don't want to lose my Britishness. Mm -hmm. I am British. And I, I, I guess if you're listening in as well, I, I would encourage you to read over the Good Friday Agreement again. I don't know that many people sometimes have actually read the document. But what stood out to me, Trevor, was that paragraph under constitutional change that um, it says that they recognise the birthplace of all the people of Northern Ireland to identify as British, Irish or both as they may choose. And it was this line that I'd like you to pick up on. Uh, and this would not be affected by any future change in the status of Northern Ireland. Um, and so I have, I have our unionist community, our precious unionist community, mm -hmm. which probably includes a lot of our, our, our family and friends. And I would just be interested to hear uh, how they can feel that their identity in any way won't be diminished. Well, the, the particular section that you quote, Karen, is, is very clear. Um, you forgive me for trying to read part of it. That's why I put my glasses on. But uh, it does confirm the right to hold both British and Irish citizenship. That's accepted by both governments and would not be affected by any future change in the status of Northern Ireland. It also says somewhere in the agreement that the, the terms of the Good Friday Agreement would still apply, even in the event of reunification, mm -hmm. which would be, be an interesting exercise, but you know that, that's what the agreement says. The, uh, they, they affirm whatever choice is freely exercised by the majority of the people of Northern Ireland, the power of the sovereign government with jurisdiction there shall be exercised with rigorous impartiality. I think that's a very important phrase. That, that means that both governments agree that they will be completely impartial and not, not try to direct the, the, the discussion as it comes. Um, they recognise it for the people of Ireland alone. They also, another interesting one is that they, they acknowledge that a substantial section of the people in Northern Ireland share the wish of a majority but the present wish of the majority of the people of Northern Ireland freely exercised is to maintain the union. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's quite possibly the balance of thinking at the moment. But I, I do believe that there's an awful lot of people out there undecided. Yeah. And since I've uh, come out in this respect, um, I do have been talking to quite a lot of people who have surprised me at times, people I would not have expected. And they haven't, they haven't come to me and said, oh, we, we agree with what you're doing, we want a united Ireland. That, that's not... They're just interested yeah. to try and find out what my thinking is and what I'm referring to when I read bits of And I would certainly encourage everybody to, that hasn't already done it, which I think is probably most of the population, to uh, read the Good Friday Agreement. It's not that difficult. It's not very long. It's well set out. It, it's a good read. And uh, so we'll, we'll see where we take this, you know. But yeah. uh, the, the rights guaranteed in the Good Friday Agreement are solid. And I, I thoroughly approve of it. Others, others currently now who refer to the Good Friday Agreement and want it upheld, but they actually forget they didn't sign it. <laughs> yes. And the same goes to the St Andrews Agreement. A different party didn't sign that. So let's be consistent here. Mm -hmm. It's a good document. Yeah. It's not set in stone forever. Mm -hmm. I, it's a bit like the protocol, you know. There's always room for tweaking and room for change, but the, the basic tenets of it yes. are solid. And, and that's something that the unionist community can take comfort from. Yes, and we, yes. We, we have to <coughs> try and convince the unionist party yeah. to join in the discussion. Yes. And we'll get to citizens' assembly and so on later on, but uh, there's a discussion to be had. Yeah. And I would like to find sensible, no, not say sensible, unionists who would be prepared to involve themselves in that yeah. discussion. Yeah, and, and I, I think you, 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 you highlighted a really great point there, Trevor. There are... Uh, there are those that will just say no, yes. um, and we have to respect that. And we've said that many times as an organisation, that what is important to us is to continually extend the hand of welcome and invitation mm -hmm. to join the conversations and be part of that. Um, but there is also this ground, particularly not least because Brexit has catapulted us to this place where people... I, I think, in my experience, are just tired of the same old and the same old. 
and we're kind of confined and looking in on that. And I think that that many folks, the kind of the middle ground, mm -hmm. the unheard, the undecided, are beginning to kind of lift their eyes up and, and question and wonder, is there anything better mm -hmm. than yeah. this? Well, would you agree with that? Well, yeah. And they're wanting to be convinced, as you said. Well, yeah. I, would, I would put it this way. 40 years ago, I would have said no, never. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. 30 years ago, I joined the Alliance Party, uh -huh. which was a step away from that position because they are neutral on the, these issues and mm -hmm. not that I respect that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I find myself involved in a movement which is, is perhaps moving towards a completely different solution. Yes. But what I want, I want the best solution for the people of Ireland, yes. north and south. As simple as that. Absolutely, and I think I think we would all agree yeah. that, that we would love that. Colin, I'm going to come back to you. I just want to read out uh, a question that was raised in the document because I would I would be really interested in how you would respond to this. Uh, what will parity of esteem and a just and equal treatment for the identity, ethos, and aspirations of both communities require of a New Ireland? <laughs> Big question. How would you respond to this? I guess the reason why I've pulled this out is because um, we are committed as a group and as an organisation to, to raise the questions, the ask the hard questions, um, and also to work our way through that, to pull in the experts. Mm -hmm. Because if we didn't do that, it just it's just like dreaming hot air in a sense. And yeah. so I'd be interested in how you would uh, respond to that. I'm well, <clears throat> going to start by, by circling back to, to something Trevor has said and it's particularly important this evening mm -hmm. because at the heart of this discussion are people and if we're thinking about all the people of this island then no better framework than a human rights framework yeah. because that's a framework that keeps everyone on this island very firmly in mind. Mm -hmm. I think to respond to your question it's a great question because part of the document underlines that there are guarantees mm -hmm. that are there already, and you've highlighted a number of them, the rigorous impartiality, the birthright guarantee, that are there, mm -hmm. that are not just you know, whimsical things that we've made up. They're guarantees and assurances for people into the future mm -hmm. about parity of esteem, mutual respect, and equal treatment. Now, the challenge with that is what has happened thus far in relation to the agreement. I think it's very well known that, for example, uh, the British government hasn't always upheld those values and obligations in the way you would expect. Yeah. And so I think people don't spend enough time thinking about the implications of that. But I'd put it like this, right, an example. People watching tonight, uh, many people watching tonight will have experiences from workplaces, right, where they've awful colleagues, right? Or they have a terrible bully in the workplace who models the worst possible behavior, right? Well, you don't model your future around that, the worst possible example. The British government, let's be candid, hasn't upheld the Good Friday Agreement and implemented in the way that we would like to see. But that's no model for the future. So what we want to do essentially is take those guarantees and make those meaningful in the design of whatever's coming next. So I think that's absolutely vital and essential. We have to approach that in the spirit of generosity around what those values and principles means. But I'm going to say something that's important to Ireland's future and why a citizens' assembly is at the heart of the recommendations of Ireland's future is because ask people, mm -hmm. ask people, mm -hmm. talk to people, what do they want to see? Uh, what I don't want to see, to be candid, is people like me, academics, walking into rooms with 700 page blueprints. Mm -hmm. I want to see those emerge from organic conversations, conversations with unionist communities, with loyalist communities to say, what would you like to see mm -hmm. reflected through these values? What would make you comfortable and feel respected in the new arrangements that we are designing? So rather than top down, I would like to see that emerge bottom up, if you like. And that's yeah. why civic engagement is so absolutely essential. But as is clear in the document tonight, as is clear in every single document that Ireland's future has produced, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is going to be at the heart of the conversation to come. Yeah, I mean, is there anything you, you want to add to that, uh, Trevor? Well, well, I would say that on the last point, 
that the Good Friday Agreement is at the heart of all this, uh, and it's it's very much in our Ireland's future's mind that it should be. Uh, frankly, I, I wouldn't be sitting here yeah. if that wasn't the case. Yeah. It's very important. And maybe just one or two other things that Colin referred to uh, about, about the, the wider question. I know we're maybe veering away slightly from the rights issue, but the uh, where, where, do, where does the British establishment stand in all this these days? What's going to happen to Scotland? What, there's a rise of English nationalism. Brexit has tilted the whole axis to nobody knows where they are now. We're fighting over the protocol. Pe people are looking at the, the protocol now and saying, this is great for us. Look at all the trade between us and the Republic. Others are saying, but it's at the expense of trade with the UK. We can't have this border. You know, you know all the arguments. <coughs> sure. it's, uh, it, it's just it's producing a, a situation which will have to sort itself out over a period. And during that period, I think this organisation can make headway in terms of trying to get the explanations that people want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Colin, I'm going to come back to you again, if that's OK, because um, I was interested, maybe because yeah. I'm a researcher myself yeah. and involved in... I, I love hearing the experience of other people mm. um, who, in a sense, are a little bit further down the road, yep. if that makes sense. Yep. Uh, and it kind of references com comparative experience. Mm. And I just wanted to mention this briefly because there are, it talks about examples in a sense mm. of people who have journeyed down a similar path, the likes mm. of South Africa mm. uh, and Germany. And I, I just wondered, um, you know, why do you think it's important that, and I think this is where our experts and our researchers come in, why do you think it's important that we spend time looking at other countries uh, who, have, who have come across a similar experience in terms of, of change constitutionally? Again, it's a great question. Uh, the answer is because we want to learn lessons. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do not want to repeat the mistakes of the past on this island. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's Ireland's future. Mm -hmm. We're thinking about this evening. And we're learning lessons from what's happened on this island, these islands, and internationally. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, looking around the world to see other how other places do this taking expert advice, uh, looking at the evidence, and building that, that into what we're doing. So in the area of human rights, for example, we look elsewhere, we look at the South African experience, mm -hmm. where they have hardwired a Bill of Rights into their constitution, uh, a Bill of Rights that includes an issue, I think, that is close to the hearts of many people across this island at the moment, and that's social and economic rights, basic bread and butter human rights around issues of housing and healthcare, that people want to see guaranteed in constitutional arrangements. And what we, say, what we see is, if other states can do this, uh, we can do this too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, other examples aren't always, they aren't always the perfect fit for what's happening on this island, but we can see what they have done, mm -hmm. the lessons from their experience and incorporate it into what we're doing. So if you take the example of the Bill of Rights process here, the Human Rights Commission produced a, an advice document in 2008 and it was interesting what they did is they, the Human Rights Commission looked around the world, looked at international and comparative experience and tried to draw that into the, the, the document. Just want to go back to socioeconomic rights, maybe end on this point. We did a bit of research earlier this year, Queen's Ulster University and the Human Rights Consortium, which was about asking people what they would like to see in a human rights doc document. There's a lot of focus in this society on disagreement. Right, there, there's many people in this society that, that love nothing more than a good old row, right? Yeah. But actually, there's a lot of agreement in this society. Mm -hmm. And on basic social and economic issues around health care and housing, people across this society want to see those guarantees reflected in a human rights instrument now, yeah. uh, but also, I would say, in the context of our discussion tonight, in the future. In fact, those socioeconomic issues are driving debate mm -hmm. across the island right now. Can I just yes, please my, do. Please on, do on, the, on the Bill of Rights question, uh, this, this subject, this discussion appears to have been going on since time began. I mean, there's a Bill of Rights body within Stormont uh, trying to come up with the actual solution to this. I wish them well because Stormont doesn't have a, a very good record of coming to agreements when there's uh, different holes in the argument. And I might refer you to another 
a report which has come out about a year ago, the FICT report. Uh, it's uh, Identity, Culture, Tradition and Flags. Uh, that, that, that report has been finalised over a year ago. Uh, it's now being held up effectively by the DUP. And, and I, I have no plenty of unionist people who don't think that that's right. You know, let put it out there. Let's be, let, let's be open and transparent about these things. And it happened to know that, that Arlene Foster in her day was quite prepared to see it out there. But at the moment, it, it's being held up. And uh, frankly, there, there's two parts to it. One's the report and the other's the implementation r recommendations. Uh, the DUP said at the executive committee just last week, Paul Gibbons said he would, he would release the report. He didn't mention the other bit, which is the media bit. You know, where do we go from here? And Michelle O'Neill had to um, put them straight. She did very neatly. And um, it's, uh, she, she's not prepared to see it released unless it's all released. And that is, is the kind of thing we're all run up against in political circles all the time. You just, and we really have to get past that. And whether, whether it leads down the road that we're talking about or leads some other way, you've got to get to a point where there's some measure of agreement in these things. Um, I, I think that we agree, and we've, we've, both of you guys have, have touched on this, and I, and I liked what you said, Colin, in terms of uh, getting right down to the grassroots of people. Uh, and, and something that's very important to us uh, is hearing people and making room and space. And we've had conversations publicly and privately and around kitchen tables. Um, I want to talk for a moment, I know you both touched on this, but I'm actually going to pitch this question to both of uh, because we need to spend a few moments in talking about a citizens' assembly, because I think we all agree, and we know as an organisation, that we want to, and we have been really championing, that we want to see a citizens' assembly, because uh, for a number of reasons, not least for what I've just mentioned there, but also to take uh, the kind of the focus of being solely politically led and shifting it to being people-led. I know recently, Trevor, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> I know recently that you uh, placed a motion, uh, presented a motion uh, to the guys um, for a citizens' assembly, and, and I'd be really, for the establishment of a and I'd, I'd really be interested in what both of you think, but why, why do you think a citizens' assembly is important? I, th I think we have to provoke a specific discussion about all this. I, I don't frankly trust the politicians to ever get it right in this, this area. Uh, you, could, you could set up a cross-party group at Stormont to, to effectively uh, examine the same issues, but where, I mean, where would it go? It would go like that. And mm -hmm. so I think that, uh, and, and don't ask me how it would actually be formed or how many, or, but I think it needs the involvement of both governments. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it needs to involve people of all persuasions, but who are prepared to discuss. It needs expert input. And, uh, not, well, he's the only expert here, but I mean, there's many experts You're in all, expert all the various too. fields, like uh, mm -hmm. health and education, all these mm -hmm. things. That, you know, there's a big, a big discussion, a big matter of research there to do. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be easier done by a committed group of, of civilians rather than politicians. So that's, that's my thinking. Uh, there, there's plenty of examples around the world of, of how civic assemblies have worked. We've had one here mm -hmm. on the social care thing. We've had a couple, two or three in the south. It, it's, uh, it's a good way to establish opinion and, and to, to, get, to get the facts out there. Citizens Assembly would produce something which was independent, dispassionate. Mm -hmm. Just uh, these are the facts. This is what might happen if you go down the road of United Ireland, or this is what might happen if we don't, you know, it's, it's, it's a discussion that needs to happen, and I think it's, it's the best way. And in my, my motion to Stormont, um, I put it down a couple of weeks ago, it's, it, it probably won't reach the order paper for a while yet, but um, I would be hopeful for it. And then the, the final line is that, the, is that this assembly would support and promote the the concept of a citizens' assembly to discuss these matters. That's mm -hmm. effectively what it says. Colin, do you want to, to add anything? Really just echo what uh, Trevor has said and commend him really for the work that he's doing in the assembly. And, and actually in the context of this conversation, the work that you're both doing, I was reflecting before tonight, this can be a difficult space 
to, to become engaged in. So really just want to commend the work that you're doing. One follow-on point would simply be Citizens' Assembly can also help with reaching deliberative conclusions. What I mean by that is this, that I think on this island we walk around with a number of assumptions about people and what they think that need to be tested through deliberation. Now, I know colleagues at Queen's, for example, have done many deliberative forums to do this. And what you find is that people can change their minds once they hear the evidence, once they get expert input, once they reflect and debate and discuss. And we've seen that happening, you know, throughout the island and the south of Ireland, recently around Citizens' Assemblies as well, that you have a chance to sort of deliberate. And I think on this debate in particular, there is a lot of mythology. There are a lot of assumptions made about people. Um, people being told what they think or labelled in certain ways, and that needs to be deconstructed and broken down. And I think a Citizens' Assembly is a, a wonderful way to, to, to do that. And also to make progress, like Trevor hinted at something there as well. You know, often, you know, change on this island is led by people on the ground very often. It's civic engagement and dialogue that has often made the change happen at the grassroots level. So that, that needs to be recognised to, to move this on to the next phase. Because maybe end on this point, like a lot of the documentation around us tonight in general talks about planning and preparing for change. And many of us have been in rooms where people say that, but it doesn't happen. And that we really now need to just press on with doing the work getting people involved in that conversation. Ireland's future will do its bit as well. And one way to do that is to establish this All-Island Citizens' Assembly immediately. I just do not understand why the current Irish government won't take this step. Mm -hmm. I might, might also say, just before you leave this point, I, I've been pleasantly surprised at the lack of criticism that I've endured in this particular area. I mean, I wouldn't... I'd Twitter, a lovely medium, but people can say what they like on it, so we get a bit of abuse on there. But in terms of people I know, people I deal with, yeah. and including many people from a unionist persuasion, they keep coming back to this. There's people out there who are prepared to discuss, prepared to listen, and perhaps prepared to be swayed mm -hmm. by the proper arguments. So um, that, that pleases me. I'm not getting dogs abuse. Maybe well after tonight. <laughs> you know, but, but you know, after tonight, Trevor. <laughs> All of us. Will. Yeah. yeah, but that, that's, that's the way I see yeah, it. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think I think we're in agreement. There's something within each of us that's driving us and keeping us going. We always will have trolls and people who will be negative. Oh, yeah, yeah. But what drives us is that desire for something better. Um, and I'm similar to yourself. I come from a, a similar background. And uh, my kind of experiences as well that, that people are, are, you know, they, they're not very vocal necessarily publicly, um, but they're very willing to encourage and, and back us and support us in this planning and preparing. Mm. And I think it's, it's also remembering as well that we are bigger than two communities. Yeah. And so the, the Citizens Assembly, and I think you guys both hit that, uh, covers that well. Um, just an end in the document, uh, these are actually two big questions, uh, but you know, you guys can, can cut them back. Um, the document ends with two important questions that I want both of you just to sort of uh, say what you feel you want to say. I'd be interested in hearing uh, your response. Uh, the first one is what sort of a united Ireland or, or a new island do you want? Uh, so we'll start with that question before we go to the next one. Talk to me, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I would like to see the island of Ireland at peace with itself. Now that sounds a bit trite, you know, but that's that sums it up for me. The, we have the the Irish nation, as it's now composed and the way it's set up, is a far, far cry from what what the way it used to be and the reputation that it had. And the you know I, I referred to it at one time as a, a priest-ridden state, which is a wee bit unkind, but you know that that sort of mentality has disappeared. Up here, we have a long way to go. We've, we've come a long way. We still have a long way to go yet. Uh, if, if this turns out that we, we end up with an island which is uh, joined and which people have all, all the rights that we've talked about, if let's put it bluntly, if they are in Georgia, would feel comfortable marching in Dublin and the people of Dublin would feel comfortable having them, 
And there is precedent for that. I mean, they march in Ross and Isla every year and they have lodges across Ireland. Um, that's, that's just one example. But we need, we need to get, a, get away from this standoff attitude, particularly that we have up here. I think the Irish are probably more receptive to this than the Northern Irish. Uh, it, it's hard to put into words exactly what I'm looking for here, but I think we need to take all this tension mm -hmm. and uh, violence mm -hmm. and disagreement out of Irish politics. And that's the way the island, I think this island would have a great future, Ireland's future, if, uh, if we could achieve some of these goals. Colin? mentioned earlier about learning the lessons from the island and around the world and it, that's a main focus for myself that learn the lessons from the last hundred years don't repeat the mistakes where this conversation goes next is to a generous place in relation to the agreement but i suppose also just tonight you know sometimes we reflect on sort of two communities narrative in relation to here. Many, many people have been failed on this island in the last hundred years. Many, many people have been failed on this island. I think of the women on this island that have been failed, the children that have been failed, minority communities that have been failed in the last hundred years. That's why human rights framework is so essential that we do not repeat the mistakes for everyone that's been failed. <laughs> And also, like for me, particularly, I spent my life working there, human rights, equality, and social justice. Like when I refer to the new in the title of this discussion tonight, you know, myself, I mean that. You know, this has to be new in the sense that the most marginalized and vulnerable people on this island who have been failed north and south in the last hundred years should feel the difference in this new Ireland that we're promising? Yeah, I, I, I think actually you've, you've answered the next question, which is what the document asks as well. Why, why, does, why does all this matter? Uh, is there anything that you guys want to add to that? Well, I think anybody who would look at the history of the island of Ireland in the last 100 years, and this is a centenary year, uh, it, it's, that, that actually has been a wee bit of a disappointment, I think, for some people. But it's, Still is the hundredth year since the Northern Ireland was formed. Um, if anybody thinks that that's been a successful hundred years, I, I have news for them. It's been it's been staggering from one crisis to another, particularly up here as long as I've been alive. And uh, I think we really need to look at ways to get past that, and that, that's why it matters. We could, if we can bring contentment, prosperity. Uh, Decent health service, I mean, it could go on and on and down the list, but you know what I mean? And those are the things that people value. Mm -hmm. People say to me now, never mind all this political stuff, what are you going to do about the education system? What are you going to do about the health service? What about policing? You know, we're we going to have regional assemblies. They're asking these questions now, yeah. and I think they're very valid and I hope they keep coming. Is there anything you want to add, Colin? Just it's slightly. It's related to the question, but it's about there'll be many people and there'll be people watching tonight and maybe people who aren't watching tonight um, and just encourage people to join the conversation. You know, part of the work of this evening, part of the work of Ireland's future is to encourage people to join in a warm and welcoming way to this conversation because, as we all know, the work has really started on this. And my worry is there are a lot of civil society groups, community organisations, that are understandably nervous about entering this space. And really, what I would say this evening is, you know, join the space, be involved, because as this conversation develops, if human rights, equality, social justice groups and others are on the sidelines, you know, don't be a bystander in this conversation. Join in and help to shape it. And human rights really need to be at the heart of that, I think. Listen, thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, I know, Colin, that you've been saying your thanks to us, but thank you to you. Uh, I think this conversation um, will continue, and, uh, and it will, and, and I really appreciate you guys are stellar. You're experts in your own field, and I really appreciate your time tonight uh, to, to, to look at snippets of this document. And just to kind of end, and, and for you guys that are tuning in, thank you so much for taking the time 
tonight. Uh, we haven't been able to go through everything. So I would encourage you, we would encourage you to download the documents, uh, have a read through. And uh, just to let you know that we'd love to hear your feedback. We want you to be part of this conversation. Uh, please do contact us. Um, you are aware, I'm sure, that we have been holding public meetings. We had one recently in Cork. Our next one is actually next Thursday in Galway. And then the following one is on uh, being held in Dublin on Saturday, the 6th of November. So there are lots of ways and lots of places that you can to put your shoulder to the wheel in a sense and be part of this because as both these guys have said it, it's about you and it's about me it's about all of us as a people so thank you for your time this evening